like to talk to all of you about prisons. I'd like to share with you the questions that got me into prison. And I might possibly convince some of you with some questions I might ask to come into prison. So you've just heard a little bit about what we've been doing over the past three or four years. We've been talking in prison. We've been spending time in prison. How did it all begin? Well, it started with a dinner party. So back in 2008, I actually was at a dinner. I had just received this award from the MacArthur Foundation. I was being asked to go out and study business models around the United States, business models with organizations that were about social change. And, and I was having one of those moments when you really feel good about yourself. I'm at a dinner, my wife and I are there, there are a number of couples, and someone asked me a question. They said, Greg, it's really great you're gonna travel the country, it's really great you're doing this stuff, what are you doing here? What are you doing in our community? And this is one of those moments when some of you have had this moment, the room goes quiet. You're at a dinner party, everybody was talking, and everybody pauses to hear what I'm going to say. And I can tell you that I didn't have a good answer. I can tell you that my world as a scholar is to teach, is to study, and not to do. My world as a scholar was to travel the country, but not to do something here. Now, you've already heard a little bit about this letter we received from Jervon Herbin asking about the potential for Darden to provide educational services to him as he makes an affirmative transition from prison. And he was the beginning of a program we've now been doing for four years. We do this program in prison behind bars at the Dillwyn and Fluvanna Correctional Facilities, Dillwyn for men, Fluvanna for women. And as you've heard, we teach entrepreneurship. We spend hours behind bars. Now, to get into our program, currently incarcerated folks have to apply. They have to fill out an application, they have to take a math test, but they also need to be interviewed. And when they sit down with me for their interviews, I get a chance to talk to them. And the first question I ask every one of them is, why are we meeting here? Why are you and I meeting here in this place? And let me tell you a little bit about what I hear from them. Louise is a woman I sat down with just a few weeks ago. Louise said she shot her ex-husband. It's the first words out of her mouth. And in saying so, Louise told the story of having been in a series of relationships with which were abusive. Louise talked about having been abused as a child, having been abused by men that she chose once she became a young woman, having been abused by her husband, having been abused physically, having been abused emotionally, having been abused in as many ways as you can imagine. And at a certain point, Louise got fed up and shot her ex-husband. Guess what? Louise's story is not unique. Some of you may not know that nearly two-thirds of all currently incarcerated women are past victims of domestic violence. Some of you may not have known that the vast majority of women that are currently incarcerated for violent crimes were acting against a violent perpetrator. So in fact, Louise's story is not unique. And the stories I will continue to tell you will be questions that I've asked, stories I've heard, people I've touched who aren't unique. Christopher said to me, no one's gonna hire me. I have a felony. I have a scarlet letter that I wear. Well, I said, Christopher, you know, here you're making this affirmative moment in education, hopefully this will help. He said, you just don't know what it's like. This is my third time in prison. This is the third time I've tried to make this transition and people can't see past my felony. Now, it turns out what Christopher didn't know is that he's pretty right. At Harvard University, there was a study done where Harvard professors hired two 
experimenters to go out into the Boston area, and they had been trained, they wore similar clothing, they were prepared to go out and interview for entry-level jobs, just regular mainstream jobs. But each of them, in certain of their interviews, had to give their confession that they had a felony. And what they found in this study, what Christopher had experienced was proven. If they had a felony, they were one-third less likely to be called back. And this is even despite any of the things in their background. So Christopher knew something. When I talked to Muhammad, Muhammad said, I'm interested in your program because your school is very highly ranked. He knew the Darden School. He knew the University of Virginia. He knew our ranking. He knew all sorts of things about what we do at Darden. Why? Well, it turns out that 13% of all currently incarcerated folks have a college degree. It may surprise you that in the federal system, in fact, the rates are higher. It may surprise some of you to know that we've taught master's degree students. We've taught people that know CAD CAM uh, design, similar to what we heard about earlier today. It may surprise you that we've taught engineers all in prison. And some of these folks see an opportunity to have education from a top institution as a continuation of what they did before they found themselves in bars, before I met them in this place. Karee told me that the reason he wanted to be a part of our program was because he had a weight on his back. He had lives, lives of people that he had through his work in drugs, either ended families, caused lost fathers, or had people die. And he said, I have to give back. And I see your program as my way of preparing myself for that transition where I will give back. Well, Kareem happens to be a black man. And one of the things he was touching, touching into is something I certainly was paying attention to. One third of all black males, young black males, will be incarcerated, will go through the justice system at some point. And Karee felt that although he's concerned about that number, he's concerned about the role he played in that number. And his desire, his design, his hope was to use his education to change that. These were all people we admitted into our program. Since 2010, you heard that's when we started the program. We began teaching entrepreneurial fitness. We've moved on to teach financial literacy and capability. We now do what we call a resilience capstone program. That's a program where we teach people about things like how to negotiate a lease when they go out looking for an apartment, how to ask for a raise on a job, how to deal with what happens when you get a bad review. And so we try to give them these ways, these learnings in important areas that we hope will help them make that transition. That dream that Jervon Herbin had when he wrote the letter is now reality. Now, we've graduated more than 13. In fact, we've gradu graduated 87 folks. And again, from both a men's facility and a women's facility. Now, I should also tell you that while we have these 87 graduates, we also have another change going on. You see, our MBAs teach in prison. Our faculty teach in prison. In fact, I suspect some of my MBAs that teach in prison are in this room right now. In fact, what we do is we attempt to take the notion that a fish who swims in water can't help but be changed. And so our MBAs have been teaching those entrepreneurship, those financial literacy, those capability courses, those resilience capstone courses, and in fact, they were teaching in prison just last night. 30 Darden MBAs are teaching this year. So I asked them, why are you teaching in prison? Laura said, because of my father. Laura is a, fa is a past president of the Darden student body. And her father had spent time in prison, and she used to go visit him. And Laura had her own scarlet letter that she felt embarrassed to share in the Darden community because at Darden, everyone is above average. Well, because everyone is above average, what Laura tied into was also something that we know. The United States has the largest correction system in the world. 
The success of our war on drugs is that we now incarcerate 1.5% of our population, and we have another 1% that is on probation and parole. Both in percentage and magnitude, we have the largest correction system in the world. We won. Hallelujah, congratulations, we're the best. 90% of all incarcerated persons will actually be released, folks. That may surprise some of you. Now, Matt came to me, said he wanted to teach, and he said, because buddies I served with are in prison. Well, Matt was right. In fact, what Matt knew is that one-sixth of all Iraq or Afghanistan veterans are currently behind bars. That may surprise you. Post-traumatic stress disorder, challenges getting jobs, the reality of that transition has meant some people have come from the battlefield to the prison. In fact, right now, in our Dillwyn Correction Facility, we have three veterans. Bryce said he wanted to give back. Remember that statement I made about the fish that swims in the water has changed? Bryce believed that to be a business leader, one needs to be able to teach business concepts to people across a broad range of backgrounds. And in fact, what Bryce did was he recognized that by learning to teach, business concepts to people who didn't have, happen to have MBAs. He would learn to lead. The MBAs are answering this call, and so far in our three years, 73 MBAs have volunteered, and again, 30 this year alone. These are folks that come from Goldman Sachs. They come from J.P. Morgan. They come from American Express. They can afford a $100,000 degree, and they spend their time behind bars. And they're going to the best firms in the country, and they care. And they spend this time, and they're changed. They wouldn't change the experience. And someday, my MBAs who graduate from this program will lead firms, and they will say, why do we not hire anyone with a felony in our company? because I know some felons, and they can do the work. Now, there's some questions I ask myself. Why do I spend time in prison? Well, I spend time in prison first off because I'm a citizen. Some of you may know that we as a state, we as a country, spend, not only do we have this large prison system, we spend quite a bit of money. In the state of Virginia, we spend $26,000 per inmate per year for incarceration. In okay, so those of you who didn't know, that's more than we spend to send someone to the University of Virginia, the most expensive public institution in the state. As a citizen, when I look at the massive size of the spending that we make, I care about the prison system, and I care about changing recidivism. I, change, I care about ensuring that some of these people we work with don't return because it saves me money. I care because I'm an educator. You see, fundamentally, education is about taking someone who doesn't know, who doesn't have a certain knowledge, but who wants to learn and helping them make the transition. That's what I do at Dart, and that's what I get paid to do. But I don't get paid, and I go to prison to do the same thing. Because I believe that a corrections system should be about correcting. I believe that a penitentiary should be about penitence and not punishment. And so as an educator, I spend time in prison. Well, I'm a sinner. I've made some mistakes. I suspect some of you have made some mistakes. When I spend time in prison, I look at men and women who are me. I see men and women who've made mistakes, mistakes I've made. And if you're someone in this room and you drove home a little tipsy one night when you maybe shouldn't have gotten in the car, you could be in prison. If when you were in college, those of you who spent time in college, there was someone in your dorm, they sold a little weed down the hall, and maybe you bought some, well, you could be in prison. Maybe you were the roommate of the person who sold the weed. If you've downloaded some illegal software, a movie or two, You've sinned. You could be in prison. I see some of you. There's some sinners in this room. And if you're a sinner, then you know you are not that much different from the people we 
work with in prison. You already know that. I'm a human. The cost of our correction system to people's lives is significant. The cost of our correction system to families, to brothers, to sisters, to mothers, to fathers. Letters I have sent to children. Mothers and fathers I have seen at graduation when we run our prison program graduation talking about their children coming home. I'm a human and I can't help but care. Finally, unlike what I said that night at dinner, I'm an activist. I mean to make change. And this is how I think we can make change. Well, now I've got some questions for you. Let's imagine we're at our own dinner party. Let's imagine we're having that moment where the room gets a little silent for all of us. What are we doing here? What are we doing in our community? What are we doing about our corrections system, our corrections problem? Charlottesville is known as one of the greatest cities in the world, greatest cities in the United States, greatest places to live, wonderful. What if Charlottesville was the city, what if our community was the community where we showed the nation how to transition people from prison? What if our university, just as we're doing in the Darden School, expanded that notion that we will be about this change throughout? What if our communities, our institutions of, uh, of our, our nonprofit institutions, our schools, our religious institutions, what if they spent time with open arms bringing our brothers and sisters back into our communities? What if we showed people that corrections should be about connections? What if we had a community where we said, when people return, they return to all of us. That might be something special. That might be something unique. And so I ask this question and I appeal to you. These are a few photos of our folks. These are the places we spend our time. You may not be able to spend time in prison, but you could certainly connect with that 90% of people that will be released. What I'm hoping is that you will swim in the water and be changed in the way I have been changed, in the way I, my students have been changed. And I hope you will respond to the question I was asked at dinner. What are you doing in our community? I want to thank you for your time. I want to invite you to the conversation. Thanks very much.